what the mercy of God can do If you knew me then You'd believe me now You'd turn my whole life upside down Took the old and he made it new That's just what the mercy of God can do Now I'm alive to tell the story How I've overcome It's His goodness and mercy And the power of the blood And I'm so glad that my freedom Wasn't based on what I've done But His goodness and mercy And the power of the blood Six feet beneath the earth For all the things I've done All the things I've said The choices made that I regret Oh, I would still be lost But for the mercy of God And I'm alive to tell the story how I've overcome it's his goodness and mercy and the power of the blood and I'm so glad that my freedom wasn't based on what I've done but his goodness and mercy and the power of the blood Was the cross meant for me That my Savior carried Now I've been made free By the mercy of God And was the grave meant for me Where my sin lay buried Now I stand redeemed By the mercy of God And was the cross meant for me That my Savior carried Now I've been made free By the mercy of God And was the grave meant for me Where my sin lay buried Now I stand redeemed By the mercy of God Now I'm alive to tell the story How I've overcome It's His goodness and mercy And the power of the blood And I'm so glad that my freedom Wasn't based on what I've done But His goodness and mercy And the power of the blood Oh, His goodness and mercy And the power of the blood Oh, His goodness and mercy And the power of the blood And what can make 
me whole again Nothing but the blood of Jesus Say what can wash away my sin Nothing but the blood of Jesus And what can make me whole again Nothing but the blood of Jesus Singing, oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow Oh, no other found I know It's nothing but the blood of Jesus it's nothing but the blood of Jesus It's nothing but the blood of Jesus Thank you so much for joining Grace Chapel's Easter service. We are so excited to share with you about the mercy of Jesus Christ that has given me and you a new life this Easter day. Now, join me as we worship our Savior together.
Number one, the cup. Jesus gathered his disciples together for a meal to explain to them what was going to happen in the next few days. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and handed it to them. He said, all of you drink from it. This is my blood of the covenant. It is poured out to forgive the sins of many people. Two, praying hands. After dinner with his disciples, Jesus took them to a garden. He asked them to pray while he went to another place in the garden to talk to God alone. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. He began to be very upset and troubled. My soul is very sad. I feel close to death. Three, Rooster. As Jesus and the disciples left the garden, Jesus was arrested. It made some people afraid to be associated with Jesus. Peter said to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Right away, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had spoken to him. The rooster will crow twice, he had said. Before it dies, you will say three times that you don't know me. Peter broke down and cried. Number four, crown of thorns. Jesus was taken away and beaten, spat on, and made fun of because Jesus was the Son of God. The soldiers took Jesus into the palace. All of the rest of the soldiers gathered around him. They took off his clothes and put a purple robe on him. They twisted thorns together to make a crown and placed it on his head. Five, linen cloth. After Jesus died, a man named Joseph asked if he could bury Jesus in a tomb. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of a rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb. Then he went away. Number six, stone. There was a powerful earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven. The angel went to the tomb. He rolled back the stone and sat on it. His clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Seven, empty egg. On the morning of the third day after Jesus died, two women went out to tend the grave. They found a heavy stone rolled aside and the tomb was empty. Jesus' body was not there. The angel said to the woman, Don't be afraid. I know what you're looking for, Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said he would. Come here and see the place he was laying. Christ alone, my hope is found, cause he is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving sees my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand.
in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commends my destiny Well, hey everyone, really excited to be with you today. Not only because it's Easter Sunday, but it's because my 40th Easter sermon and my last Easter as a senior pastor. So thanks for showing up and making it special. But speaking of last things, no one likes a bad ending. How's that for a segue? It takes 40 years to learn how to do that. No one likes a bad ending. And a handful of shows immediately come to mind. Most of you know I'm a Seinfeld fan. If I've had a rough day or I have something I just can't get off my mind before going to bed, Seinfeld is my go-to show. But even diehard fans will agree the finale was a big disappointment. The characters we had come to love turned out to be shallow, unkind, and unfunny. Or how about The Sopranos? After six seasons, the saga of a Jersey mob family ends in a diner. Tony and the family are munching on onion rings. A few suspicious characters walk into the joint. And next thing you know, the scene cuts to black. That's it. It was so abrupt, people thought something went wrong with their cable connection. They were literally in the dark. What happened to Tony Soprano? Now, more recently, the fantasy drama Game of Thrones captured imaginations for seven seasons, only to have it all unravel in its final run. Now, I didn't follow the show, but, but by all accounts, the final season lacked the drama and character development that had been a hallmark of the series. It ended with an unlikely character named Bran the Broken claiming the Iron Throne and fan favorite Jon Snow disappearing into the haunted forest. A meme quickly surfaced and pretty much nailed what people thought of the ending. But most, most people will agree that one of the worst endings of all time was the final episode of Lost, a science fiction adventure drama that critics have named as one of the greatest series of all time. But, but in, in the final scene of the final episode, the survivors of a plane crash and of six seasons on a mysterious island suddenly find themselves all dressed up and gathered in a house of worship. 
trying to make sense out of where they are and, and where they've been and what comes next, leaving viewers feeling equally confused and uncertain. But all this to say, no one likes a bad ending. It doesn't have to be a happy ending necessarily, though we do like those. Mostly what we want is resolution. We want explanation. We want all the loose ends tied together in a sense of clarity about, about what it all means. Well, today we come to the final chapter of Mark's Gospel. And at first glance, it's a bad ending. Now we began our journey back in January with Mark's promising opening line. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And for a while, it, it reads like good news. This compelling figure, Jesus of Nazareth, bursts onto the scene with power and grace and wisdom. Sick people are healed. Demonized people are set free. Jesus drops pearls of wisdom and tells captivating stories. He, he gathers a ragged band of followers, and together they spread the news of a new and glorious kingdom to come. But then, in a matter of days, it all unravels. Jesus is betrayed by a friend, arrested on false charges, abandoned by his closest followers, falsely accused, unjustly sentenced, beaten bloody, and then brutally executed and hastily laid out in a stranger's tomb. We turn the page to chapter 16, hoping for some resolution and explanation at least, some clarity about what just happened and what it all means. Instead, all we get is a dark cemetery, an open grave, a mysterious message, and a handful of distraught women, confused, scared, and running aimlessly into the dawn. Listen to the final line of Mark's Gospel. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Well, talk about cutting to black. What happened to Jesus of Nazareth? If Mark was writing to convince people of the good news about Jesus, why would he end the story with a trio of scared women running from an empty tomb? It's such a bad ending that other writers came along and tried to fix it. Most of our Bibles have an asterisk or a line of demarcation after verse 8. And then a few more paragraphs describing Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene and the other disciples, along with some appropriate parting words and a slow fade as Jesus ascends regally into heaven. And that's the kind of ending we were looking for. And most scholars agree those things actually happened. They're corroborated by the other Gospels. But those same scholars believe that those paragraphs were later additions and that Mark's gospel ended just as he intended it to, with distraught women running from the tomb in fear. But why? Why would this master storyteller end his magnum opus this way? Well, after spending some time in the story and the rest of Scripture, I've come to believe that Mark 16, verses 1 through 8, may just be the best bad ending Ever. And I got three reasons I believe that. So let's take a closer look at what happened and, and, and why Mark tells it the way he does and what it means for us today. Because endings happen to all of us. The end of a relationship, the end of a job or a career, the end of a dream, the end of a life. And when those things end badly, they can leave us as confused and disappointed and frightened as these women running from the tomb. So let's begin with the first few verses. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? Now, as we've seen all along in our study of this gospel, Mark's writing is spare. 
He doesn't throw in unnecessary details. He offers virtually no commentary or explanation. He wants readers to come to their own conclusion about what's happening and what it means. Which means the details he does include are there for a reason. And one of those details is that this event took place in the morning. He says it two very different ways. Very early, he says, just after sunrise. And we'll find out later why that matters. But, but the mission these women were on wasn't a pleasant one. It, it had been at least 40 hours since Jesus had died. His body, which had already been horribly abused, would be in the early stages of decay. They would not only have to look on that battered body again, the body of their beloved master and friend, they would have to clean up that body and, and treat it with spices and perfumes. But we get the sense they were eager to do it, to bestow a measure of dignity on the man who had bestowed dignity on them in a time when that was not a common experience for women. But, but as they make their way, they suddenly become aware of a very practical problem, the heavy stone blocking the entrance to the tomb. Now, we know from Mark's account that at least two of them were, were there when that stone was rolled into place on Friday evening. They knew how heavy it was. They'd heard it fall into place with a sickening thud, the thud of finality, the thud of death. Who would roll that stone away for them? And interestingly, another little detail, the verb tense that Mark uses here literally reads, they kept asking each other who will roll the stone away, as if they kept repeating the same question. And, and isn't that what we all do in, in times like these, times of grief and loss, when, when we don't know what to say? We say the same things over and over. It happened so fast, or I can't believe she's gone. It's such a human thing to do in the face of death because there's so little we can do or say. But in spite of that unresolved problem, they press on anyway, which again is what we do. When someone is gravely ill, when, when they're about to pass or have just passed, we get in the car and go, or we hop on a plane or whatever. We don't always know what we'll do when we get there. We just go, hoping to figure it out in the moment. And so it was for these women. And sure enough, when they arrive, they, they find that someone has already taken care of the stone. Let's pick it up at verse 4. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Now, I'm not sure if they felt better or worse seeing that stone rolled away. Does anyone walk into a graveyard in the dim light of dawn and say to themselves, Oh, good, an open grave. I mean, props to them for going in. I'm, I'm not sure I'd have done that. Now, Mark doesn't tell us much about this young man. The white clothes are meant to suggest that he's a heavenly being. But how about the fact that he's sitting on the right side? Why does Mark include that little detail? I have no idea. <laughs> and no one does really. It could be just one of those details that confirms the eyewitness nature of, of the account. When the women recounted this story months or even years later, in their mind's eyes, they could still see that white-robed figure sitting there on the right side. Well, the result of all of this is that the women were afraid. Alarmed is the word Mark uses. In fact, wordsmith that he is, he actually uses four different words to describe their fear. Alarmed, trembling, bewildered, and afraid. 
Apparently, Mark wants us to feel the women's fear. The fear we all have of death, of the grave, and of whatever lies beyond. Psychologists call it thanatophobia, an intense fear of death or the dying process, a disorder that disrupts every aspect of life. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but I am pretty sure we all have thanatophobia. Uh, we fear our own death. When will it happen? How will it happen? How will it feel when it does happen? We fear other people's deaths, the deaths of people we love or admire or depend on. How will we go on without them? And what happens to them? And what happens to us after death? A comedian tries to joke us out of it. I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. But we will be there. And the fear of that, of the pain, of the loss, of the uncertainty, is always with us, lurking in the shadows of our lives. As I, as I was working with this passage and beginning to pull my thoughts together, it began to feel eerily familiar. I went back to my files and realized I had preached from this same passage for Easter 2020. Remember that? How frightened we were? Hunkering down in our homes? Letting our Amazon boxes sit for two days to decontaminate? Stockpiling toilet paper because we were afraid of I don't know what we were afraid of, but, but we had reason to be afraid. People were dying. So, so, so we went to this passage, Mark 16, looking for courage and hope in the face of that fear. And here we are, four years later, feeling just about free of all that. But then we hear of another mass shooting, or we watch a bridge collapse. We get an unwanted phone call, and thanatophobia rears its ugly head again. Mark ends his gospel this way because he wants us to feel that fear, not to wreck us with it, but to rescue us from it. Uh, let's press on and, and, and hear what that heavenly messenger had to say. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Now, it probably didn't sound like good news at first. He has risen. Well, what did that mean? Understand, these women had, had no context for what those words might have meant. Judaism had very little to say about an afterlife. Resurrection, if there even was such a thing, well, that, that wouldn't happen till the end of the age. These women hadn't come to the tomb with any kind of hope or expectation that Jesus might somehow be alive again. Any more than we do when we go to lay flowers on a grave. They had no reason to believe this unbelievable news. And the heavenly messenger didn't give them much to go on. It wasn't, surprise, here he is, as Jesus steps out of the shadows with a smile on his face. It was, surprise, here he isn't, pointing to an empty slab of marble. It was hardly proof of anything. But it was evidence. Jesus wasn't there. And if he wasn't there, well, then where was he and, and what happened? Now, they would have to work through all the possible explanations. Maybe somebody had moved him. Maybe they were at the wrong tomb. Maybe they were just hysterical women dreaming the whole thing up. Or maybe... 
And, and no doubt their minds were already working through these possibilities as they ran from that garden afraid. <laughs> now, maybe they were afraid it wasn't true, that they were only going to be disappointed again, that death would have the last word again. Or maybe they were afraid that it was true, and that a once dead man was now walking the path in front of them. And if that was true, that was a different kind of scary. Either way, it seemed that this story they thought had ended badly hadn't really ended yet. Now, thankfully, we have the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they tell us, how Jesus appeared to these women later in the day and then to the disciples in the upper room. They tell us how those two travelers on the Emmaus Road recognized Jesus in the breaking of the bread. How Thomas overcame his doubts when he saw the nail-scarred hands. How Jesus called to them from the shoreline in Galilee and filled their nets with fish. Eventually, they came to believe and to know that he really had risen. And we have the rest of the New Testament explaining it all to us. How Christ's resurrection makes possible our resurrection. That we too can experience life beyond the grave, which makes life on this side of the grave all the more wondrous and meaningful. How we have the now famous words of the Apostle Paul chiseled into tombstones all over the world. Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where, O oh death, is your victory? Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But Mark doesn't tell us any of that. He wants us to figure it out on our own. So he invites us to, to hear the message, to, to consider the evidence, and then to believe that because Christ is risen, we don't need to fear death anymore. <laughs> and that's the first reason this is such a good, bad ending. Because it teaches us that, that even though death is always lurking in the shadows, we don't need to fear it anymore in terms of this life or the life to come. Now, this, this all became more real to me last spring on our tour of the Holy Land. Toward the end of the trip, we visited what's called the Garden Tomb. Now, now, we don't know for certain this was where Jesus was laid, but if it wasn't this place, it was probably like this place. Now, you can see the opening cut into the rock. If you look closely, you can actually see the groove that would have allowed the stone to roll into place. It's a beautiful spot. And it was especially meaningful to me. Not only because I've been preaching this story my whole life, but because we had just laid both my parents to rest in the weeks right before the trip. I was still grieving that loss, still feeling the sting of death. But when I stepped into that tomb, which remarkably they allow you to do, I was struck by how empty it was. Here's the picture I took. I don't know what I was expecting exactly, but seeing that empty space where a body once had been but now was not brought this sudden and overwhelming sense of peace and comfort and hope it was such a peaceful space, such a beautiful moment. The thought that came to my head was, is this all you've got, death? Is this the worst you can do? Because Jesus surely experienced the worst kind of death. But death couldn't hold him. Death wasn't the end of his story. And if death wasn't the end of his story, it didn't have to be the end of my parents' story, or my story, or any of our stories. And honestly, I stepped out of that tomb, feeling more certain of his resurrection and less fearful of death than I'd ever felt in my life. 
And that's the second reason this is such a good, bad ending. It teaches us that in God's hands, even a bad ending can become a new beginning. How even death, which feels like the worst ending of all, can in fact become the beginning of something new. Now, let me show you what I mean. Listen again to what the angel said. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Now, why Galilee? That was a three-day journey. And wasn't Jerusalem where all the action was? Well, there could have been a variety of reasons, but one of them, I think, was the fact that Galilee was where it all began. That's where they first met Jesus. That's where he first captured their hearts. That's where he first called them and where they first followed. After all the bad things that had happened, the awful way it had ended, if Jesus had risen and was inviting them back to Galilee, maybe they could begin again. And, and, and why did he single out Peter, mentioning him by name? Remember how we said Mark's gospel is likely based on Peter's recollections? And remember how we said that in Mark, the details matter? Well, of all the disciples, who was feeling the worst about how things had ended? It had to be Peter, right? He'd been the leader. He was one of Jesus' inside guys. But in the end, he failed Jesus in the worst possible way. It was a terrible end to what had begun as a wonderful story. But if Jesus had risen, and if he was asking for Peter by name, well, then maybe even Peter could begin again. And if Christ's death and Peter's failure can become new beginnings, then the same thing is possible for our bad endings. I know a Christian woman who recently found herself on the losing end of a legal battle. It felt to her and to anyone familiar with the situation like an unjust decision. And it left her in a difficult place, emotionally, financially, just about every other way. It was a bad ending. But being a woman of faith, she brought her pain and her disappointment to the Lord surrendered it, as we've been talking about the past few weeks. And, and, and now she's finding strength to begin again. She senses God opening doors and, and opening her eyes to a life beyond the disappointment and the injustice. Now, that doesn't mean what, that, that what happened to her wasn't bad, or that Jesus' death wasn't bad, or that Peter's failure wasn't bad. Bad things happen in this world. And, and, and we're right to be angry about injustice and to grieve our losses and to feel sorry for our failures. But those bad endings don't have to stand. If Christ has conquered sin and evil and death, then any bad ending can be turned into a new beginning. And now, remember how Mark called attention to the fact that all of this happened very early, just after sunrise? <laughs> because mornings are all about new beginnings. Now, I promised a third reason this is the best bad ending, but, but before we get to it, I'd like to share a story with you that, that comes out of our Wilmington campus. At least that's where it began. Some years ago, a family began attending the Wilmington campus while the mom, Linda, was fighting what would become a losing battle with cancer. One of the daughters, who was a teenager at the time, is still a part of the Grace Chapel family. So we invited Paige to share a little bit of her story. So let's watch, and then I'll wrap things up. I'm Paige. 
My family's been going to Grace Chapel for about 13 years. We actually started going to the Wilmington campus right when it first opened. Me and my mom were driving on 93, and we saw the big sign like, church coming soon. Um, and we were actually looking for a new church at the time. So my mom joked that it was a literal sign from God. I grew up with both my parents, my mom and my dad, and my two younger sisters and an older brother. I have this like one really vivid memory from like my childhood and one of our close family friends was over and we were making peanut butter cookies in the kitchen. Um, and I really wanted to like go and like have my mom try the cookies. Um, but I couldn't because my mom wasn't feeling well and she was like in her room sick. So my mom was first diagnosed with cancer when I was four, or maybe three and a half. When she was diagnosed the fourth time, um, I think we all were, you know, hopeful because we had had, you know, favorable outcomes the other times, but it quickly, um, it was very apparent very quickly that this was different. I was a senior in high school um, when they kind of said that my mom would have about three months left to live. I think I definitely was scared obviously like of the unknown of what would happen after like what would our family dynamic be like what would that mean for like a lot of things would I be able to you know continue on at school would I not be able to like what would life look like after that but it was also just always in the back of your mind always wondering anytime the phone rang and it wasn't you know it wasn't my mom's name coming up on the phone it was someone else in my family it always was like this is here's the call here this is the time and it just wasn't. So it was just always these like spikes of anxiety and then kind of like intense relief of like, okay, you know, it's not today and it's not, you know, this week. She didn't end up passing away until about halfway through my sophomore year of college, um, which was a blessing and that we didn't know, but it was a long time to like live thinking, you know, anytime I saw her, anytime we spoke on the phone, like this could be the last time. My mom was like the most faithful person I've ever known. Um, she was so committed to raising up her kids, like knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, going to church, having that be a big part of our lives. And that continued for her whole life. Like whenever she would be in the hospital, she'd always be telling like nurses and doctors, like, do you know Jesus? Can I tell you about Jesus? My mom passed away um, on New Year's Day, 2016. Um, and so we were actually all home for Christmas break and my brother had been with her that night and so he was kind of the person with her when she passed. But I have this like very vivid moment um, after my mom had passed and it had been kind of, it was like the first day that there was nobody staying in our house that night and there was, it was like finally kind of quiet. And I was like sitting on my bed and I was like contemplating like, okay, do I go back to school in a few weeks? Do I not go back to school in a few weeks? And I really had almost like this, I don't want to call it a crisis of faith, but I had this moment where it was like, I actually have a choice of if I want to continue my life like believing in God and pursuing God or if I want to like stop and like not believe it and like walk away from my faith and so I started going like young adult group at Grace Chapel and and it took almost two years of kind of faithfully attending that group and some other life circumstances for me to really realize that I was mad at God and it was in that group that I was able to kind of like verbalize that to those girls and like start processing through kind of like what that meant. Even with my mom's death, like I have hope that, I mean, I have a hope not only that I'll get to see her one day, but I know that she's not in pain and she's not suffering and she's not, you know, bound to a chair in her bedroom. I think there's so much more hope when you know that somebody is now with Jesus and they're, they're healed completely. I'm way less scared of my own death because I know that there's like loved ones and people like ahead of me um, in heaven and people that I want to see again and want to be with. And so I think just like there is a, there's a different kind of hope of knowing that like I will get to see my mom. Whatever you do in heaven, she is experiencing that and thriving in whatever that means in heaven. For a long time, Paige and her family lived with death looking over their shoulder. And when it struck, it was a great loss that impacted every aspect of their lives. Death is our common enemy whenever and however it strikes. But through her faith in Christ and His resurrection, Linda believed that death would not be the end of her story. But, but a new beginning in the life to come. 
And so she found strength and courage to defy death by sharing life with her family and friends and by sharing the story of Jesus even as her body was failing. And in Christ, she will defy death by living with him forever, a life that illness can never take away. And for Paige, that bad ending could have wrecked her faith. But as she brought her grief and her anger and her questions to God, she too found strength and courage, not not just to carry on, but to, to actually overcome her fear and to live with hope, knowing that her mother is well, that they'll be together again someday. That page is actually a member of our Grace Chapel staff. And through her management of our social media, she honors her mom's life and faith by sharing the good news of Christ with tens of thousands of people. Well, I promised you three reasons that Mark 16 is the best bad ending ever. First, it means we don't need to fear death anymore. Second, it means that in God's hands, even a bad ending can be a new beginning. And third, it means the end of the story is in our hands. We've been saying all along that Mark is a master storyteller. So, true to his style, and in a stroke of spirit-inspired genius, he, he leaves us to come to our own conclusions. He invites us to, to consider the evidence, to see for ourselves. See the place The angel said to the women, go to Galilee, he challenged the disciples. There you will see him. It was on them, the women, the disciples, to take the next step. They did, and they believed, and they changed the world, turning the death of Jesus Christ into the best bad ending the world has ever seen. And now it's on us. It's on you to take the next step and decide what this all means. If you're curious about Jesus and the Christian faith, your next step might be the Alpha course. We have new courses beginning this week, several physical locations and online on Monday nights. If you find yourself struggling with Christian faith, wondering if it really stands up to critical examination and the realities of life, I invite you to come back for a series we'll begin in two weeks on April 14th. We're calling it, Why I Still Believe. And I'll be sharing very personally why after 40 years as a pastor, I still believe in God, in the Bible, in the good news of Christ, and in the local church. And if you find yourself believing this good news, then like the women, like Paige and her mom, run from this place, run from this moment, and share this good news with the world. Let's pray for a moment. Thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to consider this remarkable story, this good news. Thank you for the promise of life, of victory, of new beginnings. By your Spirit, Lord, help each of us to take whatever step we need to, to experience and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. There is a day coming When the old will pass away Every wrong will be made right No darkness, no night The sun will light the way There is a king coming The one who conquered death and grave No more pain hope for tomorrow is our hope for today He who was He who is He who was He who is He who is to come Christ the Son Crown
He is risen. He is risen indeed. A big thank you to Sarah, our dancer, for our worship service today. I've been wanting to incorporate dance into our worship service for some time now because it's such a beautiful way of expressing worship. There's a passage in 2 Samuel that talks about how David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And that's the kind of worship we wanted to express today. If you've been blessed in any way or have any questions after our Easter service, you can feel free to email Pastor Brian at brian with a y at grace.org or email me at jkim at grace.org. And if it's your first time here, or if it's your first time in a long time, we're so glad that you've joined us. And if you'd like to learn more about how to get connected here at Grace, we'd invite you to scan the QR code right here up on the screen and let us know how we can help you. And filling out the connection card here doesn't just let us help you, it helps someone else as well. Here's how. We'll give a $10 gift on your behalf to Fostering Hope, an organization that cares for children and families impacted by foster care. All the information I'm sharing with you is also available in our app at Grace Chapel Connect, which you can download on your phones. If you're new here, this is the Grace Chapel online campus, and we have people worshiping with us from all over the world, which we love so much. However, I know that some of us might be more local to the New England area. So if you are, and if you have some young kids, I want to share with you about one of the greatest weeks of the year here at Grace Chapel. Here is a short video to show you what I'm talking about. If you go to grace.org slash kidsweek, you can register for any of the other campuses kids weeks. Now for our adults in the room, let's talk about you. Maybe you've got questions about life, faith, God, the Bible. Alpha is a six week experience that meets once a week and includes content, conversations to fuel growth in our faith. Thousands of people have taken the Alpha course here at Grace Chapel over the years and found it to be a life changing experience. To register for our Zoom Alpha course, you can go to grace.org slash alpha. Today is a very special uh, Sunday here at Grace Chapel, but we've got another special service coming up on May 12th. That day, all of our campuses will be gathering together in Lowell Auditorium for an event we call One Church Sunday. More information about that event will be available on our website at grace.org slash one church Sunday. We've been hearing for a few weeks now Thy will be done. And what surrendering means when we are in relationship with God. You know, it's been such a powerful reminder of what Jesus did for us. And today we are celebrating the resurrection of our Savior and that we can receive forgiveness and have relationship with God as a result of Jesus' incredible sacrifice for us. So as we close our service and reflect on what today represents, both personally and collectively, we will now have an opportunity to give back out of love and gratitude for our great God. So as we prepare to give an offering, please know that the faithfulness and generosity of this congregation is impacting so many people. You can give by going to grace.org and scrolling down and choosing the online campus. Thank you so much for being here with us and joining us for our Easter service. Happy Easter and go in peace.